Hey, it's Karen Kalla. And we're back with another episode of the Boozy Bitties. This is the drink as you learn school with two longtime friends. And sometimes we're just two boozy bitties. Let's click our ruby grenache colored heels together and say there's no place like Rome three times. Maybe we will appear there. Couldn't have said it better myself. Today we talk about the predominantly red wine driven region of the Rhone Valley. So grab some Syrah and drink with us. It's bad when I don't read the intro before I have to say it because I'm just like. <laughs> yeah, I actually I wrote these intros two days ago. Like for once, like usually I'm writing them right before we hit record, and that's why they're usually such trash. But even when I've <laughs> given myself time, they're still not good. I thought maybe you would have read it because it was already in it's there. Better but than I could do. That's I do I love know. that you don't read them because your reaction to me is just genuine and it mostly it's just well Kala. Oh, no not again. <laughs> not again. But that said, like it is true. It's when I like Roan wines, like I don't think I've met a Roan wine that I haven't liked. I agree. I'm super surprised we've never recorded on the Roan Valley. We just like I think we were doing the passport tour for so long during like it was the summer of 2020 into like Maybe the winter, spring of 2021. I think we were just so over it by the time we got to France that we like skipped half of Fr- France's wine regions. Not to mention that the Appalachian system there is kind of killer. And I just hate pronouncing French. True. So I think we just like, we just left off a bunch of things. I don't think we did Provence either. <laughs> no, which is another good one. <laughs> and it's just like, I feel like all of these episodes, a lot of them recently have still been inspired by like the aftermath of our Two Shepherds interview because we did Jora because of Trousseau and we talked about Trousseau wines with Two Shepherds. They love Rhone. So we were like re-inspired by Rhone with them. We did the episode on Grey Grapes. (laughs) (laughs) It's good. They reinvigorated our our podcast topics. (laughs) I cannot wait to go see them. (laughs) We just just planned that. Yeah, we should do that. But yeah, so – Rhone is, it's really a region that's made up of like two very distinct districts. And red is king here, red grapes. They fucking love the red wine out there. And so there's the Northern Rhone Valley and the Southern Rhone Valley. The Northern Rhone is a smaller little area. Southern has more of the geography to it, but they're located along the Rhone River. Easy, easy. The North is mostly known for Syrah. The South is mostly known for Grenache, but they have other things going on in there. Yeah. No, I just love, I don't know, like... Maybe I'm just a bad wine person, but like Bordeaux, I just like, I I like Bordeaux wines, but I just can't, I can't confidently buy one (laughs) and know what I'm going to get and like it. Honestly, can't either. It's the most overwhelming of the French wine regions to me. And there's just so much pressure to it too, because it's produces some of the world's like most cult, high end, expensive, historic wines. And I like still can't be like, which one is the right bank? Is that Cab or Merlot heavy? Which one's the left bank? What's the middle of the banks? The Entre de Mer? Like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> I'm the same way. Like, I like I will never drop $50 on a Bordeaux bottle unless my wine store guy picks it out for me because then he knows exactly what I like. But like, I easily, I went to there and I just grabbed a Higondas yesterday. So I was feeling a little bit, a little bit fancy. And sp- yeah, I think it was like mid 40s but i just i've never met a hagonas that i haven't loved like never so that's easy when you like find that region and you kind of know but like i still couldn't tell you what the predominant grapes are from that region like is it a cab heavy one is it a merlot heavy one oh sorry we're back in the rhone thing i i was i'm still stuck in my head on bordeaux because i'm just yeah, still overwhelmed yeah, yeah, by it. it's giving me anxiety like my heartbeat is like yeah increasing right now can we stop talking yeah. about bordeaux all the things yeah no, hagonas i think is mo- tends to be more grenache so this the one that i had I still I drank half of it last night. I'm going to have the other half tonight. Um, but it's Domaine Santa Duke of Liu de Higondas. You're nailing <laughs> that. <laughs> you nailed that. <laughs> Domaine Santa Duke of Liu de Higondas. <laughs> You, you, made it, you made it sound more French. <laughs> I just because I just tried an accent <laughs> and like tailed away from the microphone a few times. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I just want to like have uh like our podcast producer just have him like dub in a french speaking person <laughs> french per- yeah, like can, french we, just man. Put, <laughs> can <laughs> we just put a, like a french person on staff here and just be like your job is to pronounce these and then dave is just gonna put you in right exactly. it goes from like our like voices to just a deep male french voice <laughs> 
Maybe we need to do that because, yeah, we're just, just so a little. Where's Mark Andre in a dough when you need him? I know, just didn't come. Yeah, so that's what this one is. Like I said, it was mid 40s here, and that looks like it's from when I was looking online. That looks like it's pretty much consistent with what the internet says it should be around. Oh, it's not like my cremat that I had the last episode that was like, it could cost between 25 and 75 to 75. <laughs> yeah, no. This one is a uh, 75% Grenache, 13% Mouved, 10% Syrah, 2% Chinso. And it's from eight different plots in Hagondas that are biodynamically farmed. And I guess these guys, it's a, a state of the history that stretches back to 1874, six generations of winemakers. Damn, can you imagine having your path laid out for you like that? I told you, my like, goal for you in life is I want you to go meet the youngest one and marry him. I guess I his just, I'm more, I'm, name I'm is more Benjamin. The cowboy he, thing. <laughs> Benjamin, he just assumed the helm in 2017. So Benjamin is maybe like what, 40? I mean, I've dated older. <laughs> 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 well, whatever he is, we're going to go meet him. But he's the one who they've been doing organic for a while. They've been a pioneer of organic viticulture since 1985. But Benjamin got them all into biodynamic stuff um, when he took over in 2017. I'm noticing in a lot of the wines we've been talking about from France recently with these. It happened in my last episode. I think we've had it a few other ones. These younger generations that are coming in are really starting to like shake up. Not totally shake up, but they're they're going towards these more biodynamic and organic styles. Like we're having two back-to-back biodynamic French wines on these episodes right now. And it's not like they – what I kind of like about them too is they don't like lead with it necessarily. Like mine, like if you went and looked for it, it is Demeter certified. But it's not like – you know, it's like American branding. It would be all over the bottle. Biodynamic at the top. Yeah. Like I'm looking at my bottle still since we were recording back to back and it doesn't say anywhere on here that it's biodynamic. It just, it said it on the website when I was looking up the information about it. Right. It was disgorged in May, 2022 though. I did not realize that. Thank you for that. Yeah. No, but this wine, like, like I said, I've never, I've had several, hey, go into us. I don't know when I first, I think I had my first one when I was working at a restaurant, like during college. I worked at one of the restaurants I worked at had a pretty good, like old world focused wine list. Um, but I think ever since I had that one, I loved it. So every time I've seen one and been able to have one, I, I have, and I've just loved them all. Um, and this one is the same. It's fruity because of that Grenache and some of that Syrah, but it's also this really super well balanced. The tasting notes say fine, herbaceous notes in its youth. It generally undergoes a slow evolution towards more spicy notes after several years cellaring. Um, and it is recommended to cellar it for at least three years. So they say 2022 you haven't done that, the, obviously. the earliest. Well, no, they say because it's 2019 release. So. Oh, okay. Okay. 2022 is the earliest you should open is what I saw. But then 2023 plus is recommended. That said, if I get a spare $100 in the next few weeks, I'm thinking about going back and buying two bottles and putting them in our little... <laughs> if wine, it's not really a wine cellar it's i think it's a root cellar technically but that's where we've been putting wine in our basement so well you do have one of those like older connecticut houses that has like the, I think it the basements is, like, that are like perfect for that it's officially a root cellar but we don't store roots there so we're gonna store our wine there <laughs> i think that is the smarter option of the two i don't need that many potatoes <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so this is delicious definitely recommend it and I, we jumped forward to that. So I don't and know you can you pronounce go back. that one more time for us, Kara, just no, for the okay. listeners. So they can remember well, I wine. do have another wine to talk about, so we can butcher okay. that one later. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I just, we, just, we just stopped caring. We're just like, we know. I mean, we love this fucking wine, but we just know we're going to pay like no like due diligence to how we're going to try. We're not even going to try. Right. It's not out of disrespect, though. It's just like, I just literally... This is not a dumb American My mouth does stuff. not do the French words. I'm glad. Thank you for finishing with the French words. My mouth does it not does do... Other French and there was a pause. Yeah. <laughs> what I does your mouth... It was going to get to the dangerous water that I was yeah, like, just gonna... like what, those good. what that mouth do? Not the French words. <laughs> What that mouth do, bitch? <laughs> Not fucking French. <laughs> so <laughs> what I love about Ro, and we'll try to backtrack to, to some things about it, they have like their own little weather thing there, the Mistral ones. Yeah, and I'm wondering, I feel like there was some, it's not Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> somewhere there was some other like adventure kind of sci-fi fantasy movie where they're like the mistrals and maybe it was inspired by this i don't know so the mistral the mistral wings lay mistral the winds they like i was like does mistral mean something in french that's bad and if you just google mistral translation it's like the winds of rhone like that they, they have their <laughs> this own is what name they are. <laughs> 
they have their own fucking name and it's this cool and like this is like hitting home to me right now because i'm in denver where it's like 40 mile an hour wind gusts outside right now but it's a cold fierce wind that blows from the northern seas as an important part of the culture of southern france and provence they blow at an average speed of 60 miles per hour and so hurricane wind speeds start at 70 miles an hour so pretty fucking strong and the wind blows for 150 days of the year that's a lot. Like, I bet people go fucking wind crazy. I would, yeah. If I was being I mean, pelted by hair? 60... 60- <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just buzzing it at that point. Would, I wonder what the haircuts are like in the run. If there's like a large percentage of women with very short hair. <laughs> Maybe they're all doing braids. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But like 150 days of 60 mile an hour wind gusts, that will make me go nuts. And it goes to the winter, so awesome at the coldest point of the year for them. Super cool. Then into early spring, and they can be super destructive and damaging. They can, like, uproot vines. They can cause all sorts of problems. But apparently, it's always followed by clear, bright blue skies, and they provide abundant sunshine for the vines, blowing away the fungus-loving moisture from the grape clusters and bringing in cooler temps during the summer. <laughs> okay, so it's the, the silver lining of them, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there was a winery that I worked for. One of my wine supplier jobs, they had this brand called Les Mistral, and it was kind of an homage to Joseph Phelps, who is an iconic winemaker from California. He was one of the people who created the Insignia wine, which was like this cult level wine and very big and like steakhouses and stuff. His passion project was Rhone wine. And he was the first person in California to create the first varietally labeled Syrah. So this wine line that came in, it was owned by Joseph Phelps, to my understanding. And then this other company bought it still call it Le Mistral, but it's based off these Rhone winds. But yeah, it's also one of the oldest wine-growing regions in France. Oh. <laughs> You're the one that wrote the history part. <laughs> <laughs> but like, did I say it was the oldest? I did in my basics. That was my segue into your stuff. That was me giving you the opportunity to discuss history. I was trying to put it on track. Sorry, I, 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 missed, I missed the segue. But... Uh... <laughs> Because I think, I feel like a lot of the regions within France had some of this history. I mean, it's just, we just talked about Moldova and it was here, it was similar. Um, wine I mean, production it's just anything was introduced. In Europe. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, mean, I just assumed maybe. I don't know. Sorry. Yeah. So the Greeks introduced wine to the Rhone Valley in the fourth century BC. Um, they settled around where present day Marseille was. And I did, just, I was doing this research. This is bad French geography. This sent me on a huge tailspin because I was like, wait, Marseille is by Paris, but this is not near Paris because I was getting Marseille confused with Versailles. Yeah. So it happens to the best of us. Yeah. So they settled around Marseille and I guess a lot of them were Rhodians from the Greek island of Rhodes. So they named the area after themselves, which sort of gave the Rhone Valley that. That's so like egotistical of them. They're like, I love myself so much. We're just going to name it Rhodes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think, I don't know if they named it Rhodes specifically, but they named it Ro something, and so it just became Rhone Valley. The French version of it, Ro. (laughs) (laughs) Missing half the letters. They just take out the D, E, and S. Yeah, they're like, that's how you pronounce it here now. And similar to Moldova, which we just talked about a few episodes ago, the ancient Romans then came after the Greeks. They refined the plans. They had more advanced sort of viticultural practices and uh, wine production and storing methods. So they came and they did that. But then development of viticulture here came to a halt after the fall of the Roman Empire. So there was a big gap. But then in the 14th century, the papacy moves from Rome to Avignon. And the Avignonese popes, I guess they didn't care for the local wine. So they were like, we're just going to plant lots more vineyards and make our own wine. And this is partially where we get some of this uh, shot to neuf to pop. Like, that's why the the pope, the father, the pop is a... or is it, do we say pop or is it pa? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I always say shot new to pop. I always say pop too, but now I'm doubting myself. Well, that's why the, you hear me, I was like, pop. <laughs> I was just like, do I say the P at the end? I love that. We know it's not poppy, pop. so. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the uh, David Ortiz's wine region from the Red Sox. <laughs> it's a big poppy's vineyards. I love that the translation of shot new to pop is crib of the Pope, the Pope's crib. I'm like just imagining like MTV, <laughs> like, like Cribs edition. Like he's like, yo, come nearby. on in. Here's my fucking vineyard. Like that's all I can think of in my head. <laughs> but yeah, but that's 
they've had pretty, I mean, they've since then, like they've had the normal things like phylloxera and things like that. But for the most part, since the popes moved back in there and sort of revamped the viticultural practices after the Roman Empire ended, it's just been smooth sailing of lots of wine ever since. I mean, the other thing I like about Chateauneuf de Pop, besides that it's the Pope's new crib, is that when I was looking this up, it's known for 13 or 18, depending on how you count them, grapes. 13 or <laughs> Okay. I was reading. So I took my certified specialist of wine like 15 years ago. I was like young when I took this. And I do every once in a while purchase the new study guide because like when I took it, there was like a paragraph about Argentina. And now that wine has changed so much, there's like more information. And they, so I like to buy a new copy of this, the textbook every few years, which you can buy on Amazon really easily, just to like have better information to use for these podcasts or understand how wine has changed in 15 years in these new world countries. But it was saying it's like 13 or 18. And I was like, what the fuck? That's like a five grape difference. What are you talking about? Why can't you figure it out? <laughs> and it's because they, instead of just saying Grenache, you can just say Grenache, but they technically allow like Grenache, Noir, Gris, and Blanc. Um, so that could be okay. there. Or like Peak Pool, they have like Noir, Gris, and Blanc Peak Pool. And then they have Claret and Claret Rosé. Well, that's like seven different ones. Well, it's, it's, uh, math is not my strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> so I just love that they're like 13 or 18. You pick yours. But that is one of the biggest regions out of Southern Rhone. And I think one of the ones I gravitate to the most. Like Northern Rhone's, I'm trying to look. I need to, there was a Cote ro- Roti, Rotier? What do you do if there's an IE? It's a Northern Rhone, yeah. Yeah, there Cote was one at my wine store. Maybe I'll get that to try because I feel like most of the ones I have tried are Southern. Although that said, I, I've had Crow's Hermitage wines before yeah that's okay i'm, I'm confident i love all the rhone wines it's not just i think northern we or yeah something. and if you're going to northern you're getting more syrah based you're getting like those bigger heavier reds the three big ones are as kara mentioned two of them coat rodier hermitage and then cornas is another one of them and they're like highly regarded for very excellent long aging wines like this is a shit you're gonna throw in that root cellar kara and then there's Crozet Hermitage and St. Joseph are two larger ones. Cornas is the only one in Northern Rhone that's 100% Syrah. I just like blends. I love the, I, I do. Love blends. And that's why I think I gravitate towards Southern Rhone because give me a good – I'll say it slowly after you made fun of me that one. I'm a good GSM. <laughs> Not to be confused with jism as Kara said if I say it too fast. A good GSM. M. Grenache, Grenache Syrah, Syrah Mavet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I love that like jamminess that you get from it. And I think that's why I'm a Southern Rhone girl. And there's so many of them. And that's how I kind of look at it sometimes a little bit like a ladder. So like Chateauneuf de Pop is like the big fancy one. And like it's hard to find a bottle of Chateauneuf de Pop for less than 50 bucks. So that's like the big one. And then step down, like the little neighbor next door is Hagondas. So still very good, but also pretty similar. But it's just not quite the same level. And then I don't know if they would qualify it this way, but I kind of sometimes see it. The Vaccarat is like a little step down from the Hagondas. So they're all sort of blends of some of the same grapes. Vaccarat is sometimes described as the younger sibling of Chateauneuf de Pop. But that said, I tend to find they're a little bit, they're not quite as like, I don't want to say heavy because I don't want to like give people the impression these are like California cabs, but like they're not, I don't know, I feel like the Hugonas have a bit more like meatiness and like complexity to them. So I find them to be more similar to the Chateauneuf de Pop. Not that I've had a ton of either of them. I mean, the Chateauneuf de Pops, at least. The Chateauneuf de Pops is not something I treat myself to very often just because no. of, yeah. It's just, a, it's hard thing. I almost did get one because there was one at the wine store that was at a similar price point to the Hugonas that I had, but I was skeptical. I was like, why is this one only 40 five dollars <laughs> so maybe i'll try that another another time because your second wine there is vaccara yeah so this is one that i've had a, f- a few times and i find vaccara they tend to be a bit more approachable from a price standpoint like you can easily find them in like the low 20s whereas i gonna be harder to find um in that price point like i think Hagonas tend to be more in the 30s, 40s, 50s. Vaccaraz you can find in the 20s and 30s. Um, so the one that I had was Domaine Le Coralou, 2019. That's 60% Grenache, 25% Syrah, and 15% Muved. So uh, GSM, as Cal likes to say. Well, that's what they call it in the industry. <laughs> Do they? They call it a jism in the industry? <laughs> they call yeah. I'm like, hey, guys, I'm going to pour you this jism from Australia today because I work with an Australian GSM. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, here's a jism. <laughs> Well, maybe. I mean, if you hear it enough in your life, you're going to start repeating it. <laughs> yeah, so this one at my wine store is 
like twenty twenty one dollars, and that I guess on the internet says twenty twenty five. So spot on. It's described as big, spicy, robust, and somewhat jammy. And this is a favorite example of the region of Robert Parker, which I'm ashamed to say because <sighs> two shepherds they're gonna. <laughs> No, maybe they don't listen to us after they've recorded. They're like, one and done with these ladies. Really good. <laughs> if not, we love you, William and Karen. If you still listen, we love you so much. And I'm sorry that I like a wine that Robert Parker does. It's I don't want to like put too much info out there right now because we do have our biggest interview coming up in, in June. There were some statements about this idea of like in this book that we were reading um, about the idea of like these celebrity wine experts. And, and, and you know, William and Karen said the same thing. It, it just almost does hurt to like fall into that umbrella sometimes because they have a style that they like and they'll rate that all day, every day. And yeah, anything that they don't like, they don't. That- yeah, they, they're like, I don't fucking care for New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc so I'll never give New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc a good rating. But I fucking love Rhone or Bordeaux or whatever. So it, it's really hard sometimes with these really important white people. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the point there was there's a little bit of a, it's a taste difference. If they only like this one niche and, Someone else doesn't care for it. I don't find this one as, I don't know if I would describe it as jammy, but it is like a big, spicy, robust red. It's not, that said, it is more, I did find that because I had them both this week. I did find this one to be more fruit forward. So a bit fruitier, a little bit more sweeter than the Higonas. The Higonas just has a bit more like balance and like pepperiness to it. So that's my official wine review. So you guys can quote me on (laughs) that. (laughs) I mean, we've talked a lot about Grenache and Syrah so far. Obviously, they're like the two stars of this region. The Maved is, is in there as well. There are some white wines that come out of here. They do really well in the north with Viognier, which is one of my favorite white varietals to drink. I love Viognier. And apparently, the quality of Viognier that comes out of the north has like, it's pretty much like set the benchmark for Viognier around the world. Which appellation is that, you ask? It is... <laughs> Shit, which one is it? Condru and Chateau Grier. They produce 100% Viognier, highly regarded. But it's kind of, as much as it's a big red region, they do have this smaller area. I think white wine only accounts for about 5% of the Rhone. Um, that has made, like, famous, high-end, excellent Viognier. Interesting. Hagondas does have a white as well, but I don't know what the grapes are in that one. So there's, like, a Hagondas Blanc, if you will. And then the regular Hagondas. I'm trying to see if I actually wrote anything about it, but no, that would have been me trying harder than I needed to try. Yeah. No, the, uh, yeah, their, their red is the standard G- GSM, but they can have a maximum of 10% of any sanctioned variety of the standard red coat during Appalachian laws, with the exception of Carignan. I guess the Hagondans are against Carignan for some reason. Okay, interesting. I was like kind of having like these flashbacks. I'm looking at these, you know, Appalachian notes right now, how these flashbacks to when I took my certified specialist wine exam, like I said, 15 years ago, maybe more than that. I don't know. But I remember this exam question from this. I even wrote in the notes, Tavel, which is one of, is the rosé appellation in Southern Rome. And that's all I do is only rosé. And it was one of my exam questions. And I write in the notes, Tavel, rosé exclusively, was one of my exam questions. No one cares. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I think, this, this is, you know, when I write the notes, usually it's like the end of my work day. I've opened up my wine for the night and I was doing the other episode first. So by this point, I'm just getting a little looser with what I'm writing. I'm like, no one fucking cares that, that, you, yeah, that you remember that Tavel was one of your questions and that you got it right. <laughs> I don't know if I've had a Tavel rosé, so I got to look for one of those now. Never had one. And I don't know anything about whether or not they're exported wildly or anything like that. But I just remember that. I was studying all these fucking Appalachians from France. I had to know every goddamn one of them from Bordeaux and Burgundy and everything and what they did and what they made and what they grew. And Tavel was like, rosé only. I'm easy. And it was on my exam. <laughs> I was like, like, I got this one. <laughs> I got this one in particular. This one I know. <laughs> That's funny. But okay. But I'll put that on my list. I'm just getting a bucket list of all the wines I have to try now. The Vignon from last episode. Tavel rosé now. Oh, yeah. There's just a lot out there that we really need to get into. Another shot to nip to pop at some time. <laughs> yes. Time. Yes. When we have money. <laughs> there's some others. I mean, there's way more Appalachians in this area than really needs to be discussed today, just because it's boring for me to list off. This one makes this. This one makes this. There are some styles that are a little unique, not totally unique, but are, are specific to 
these areas. Like there's a sweet wine region called Muscat de Boom de Venise, and they make a vin du natural that's made with Muscat, which is another big grape that they grow out there that has an alcohol level at least 15%. There's an area called Rasto that does another vin du natural, which is Grenache, including the Noir Blanc and Gris versions. And they can make that into a tawny, white, rosé, or red dessert wine. So they do have some dessert wines popping out. And then a Claret de Die, this is their sparkling wine region as well. And Karen, I love the bubbles. So we always have to mention the sparkling wine AOC. So is that with the Claret grape or is it a different? It is. It's with the Claret grape, which I hope I'm pronouncing it right because it can be kind of confusing because there's Claret, C-L-A-R-E-T, which is that style of wine. But this is Claret a Grape, C-L-A-I-R-E-T-T-E. And they have like a rosé version and a light, a white version, essentially. And it's apparently one of the oldest varietals from the area. It has been seen in Rhone as early as 1490. And the translation of the name translates to light white. So my legs look like before I've been out for the summer. A light white, though. A light white. White is it's just one my color. legs before I've been, <laughs> when I've come through the winter. I wore shorts yesterday and I was appalled yeah. at the claret color <laughs> the of my color. legs. <laughs> I did look it up and the Hagondas white is made with predominantly claret grape. 70% 70, 70 of that. And then other permitted varieties include Berbalink. Berbalink? No, that's a food, isn't no. it? No. Okay, you don't, you don't have it on your list. It's... Well, there's a lot of grapes. Yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not criticizing you for it. I'm just saying you're not going to see it there. Oh, I have it down under the at the bottom of the thing. The square idea, grapes of Chateauneuf de Pap. Okay. Yeah, blank is in there. Yeah. It's weird, spelled kind of weird. And then the Claret Rosé grape could also be. It's probably Berbalank. And we're just saying Berbalank. That is true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is like kind of painful for us to do French episodes. Like, we love these wines. Like, we obviously love Rhone. We love Jura. We love Alsace. But, like, God, can we... It's, like, torture for us to try to make French come out of the mouth. I was kind of thinking we could do a mini on languedoc Roussillon next, but I don't know if we can do another French episode. I think we might need... I think we might need a break. I think we might need a break. <laughs> yeah. And it would be very mini, because I feel like they do a lot of the same grapes as Rhone there. It, it's true. I think it's still important to talk about, obviously. But there are some other grapes that I thought were kind of cool that we have not touched on. And we'll just go through that. Peak Pool is out of here. And I love a good Peak Pool wine. You can find some varietal Peak Pools. Um, it can be spelled P-I-C-P-O-U-L or also P-I-Q-U-E-P-O-O-L. <laughs> Peak Pool. But it's from the Van Cluse in the southern France. And that comes in three berries as well. So now we're learning all these things about how we know that there's mutations to make gris and white and red. Oh, this is Peak Pool Gris. Was that in our gris episode? Do we miss no, one? No, we, we missed one, Kara. <laughs> We missed one. And then the other one is Tourette Noir, which is another one that has a gris and blanc mutation that we missed on the Grand Cream episode as well. And that's one of the oldest varieties of this region. So they do some other things. We also, did we ever even talk about Marsan and Roussan? Those are two major ones from Northern Rhone. No, we haven't mentioned No, nope, they're white wines. Really yeah. big. <laughs> yeah, I like Roussan a lot. Yeah. So this is predominantly red, as we've talked about, and we love everything from these vineyards, it seems like. We just can't afford all of them sometimes. Yeah, not not all the times. <laughs> if there's any takeaway you can get from this, Chateauneuf de Pop means the Pope's new crib, and that's an MTV episode, I'm pretty sure. But if you want an affordable one, try a Baccarat because yes. they're baby Chateauneuf de they're baby crib Chateauneuf de Pops. <laughs> <laughs> the Pope's the Pope's summer house. <laughs> this, this, <Yeah. laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's a tiny cabin. Yep. All right. Orgasms and alcohol. Double fist yourselves. GSM.